The Old Testament reading is Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Our gospel lesson is taken this morning from Mark 9, verses 30 through 37. They went out on there and passed through Galilee, and he would not have anyone know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand the saying, and they were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had discussed with one another who was the greatest. And he sat them down, and he called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. The Gospel of Christ, the Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It has been my joy, my calling, and my privilege to work in hospice settings for the past nine years as a hospice, as a hospice chaplain and to serve with a team of professionals as we served and met with and cared for and journeyed with patients and families in those very sacred last moments of life. But this, no, this new opening coming to me now to serve as a parish associate will give me a chance once again to be with people in other sacred moments of life as well, for there are many sacred moments in life. And I'm looking forward to this opportunity to return again to a church, a parish, a congregational setting. I'm looking forward to getting to know all of you at Westminster, and I certainly had an opportunity to meet a few of you um, this morning over coffee. And then a couple of weeks ago when I was here, again, that opportunity. People have been very welcoming um, and kind and um, made me feel at home. For what I heard and have, can attest to is it's a wonderful group of people. Um, who love the Lord and serve God, not only here in this church, but out in the community. I was excited, too, to hear about all the wonderful um, things that are being done in the community um, and the ways in which this church has historically reached out um, into the community and been a part of Bay City. As a young adult, I was drawn to the verse, Philippians 1, verse 6. And in the New International Version, it says this, I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work in you, in you, will bring it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. Those words gave me hope and courage 
as a young adult in those years of my life. But years later, when I went to seminary, I read the verse this time in the New Revised Standard Version, and it says this, I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you, not just in you, but among you, will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. Here the translation makes it clear that it is the work among us. God's work is not just an individual grace, it is grace among us. And I'm thankful for that. Thankful that I, thankful that we can be confident in God who is doing a good work among us as the church of Jesus Christ. And so I'm thrilled once again to be serving in the setting of a local church and to be part of the journey with you and with God. So thank you. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, dear Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I begin then this morning with one of the sacred stories, if you will, from my life as a hospice chaplain. For about a year, it was my privilege to journey with a gentleman and his wife as his health slowly declined and as he neared the end of his life. And though he was declining in body, he certainly wasn't declining in spirit. I visited with him every other week, and his greatest joy was to talk about his very beloved little granddaughters. One was in pre-kindergarten, and one was in early elementary school. I can still remember, I can still hear his laughter, he and his wife, as they told me the story of their, about their little pre-K granddaughter, who one day got into just a little bit of trouble at school. She got into trouble for lying. Her mother was called in by the teacher, and the truth came to light. It wasn't as she had gone home and told that another child had misbehaved in school. She had lied to her parents, besides lying in school. But it was her. She was the one who had misbehaved, and she had lied to them about it. Once home, when it came to light and her, all the family understood, her parents understood what was going on, they kind of had a sit-down talk with her, told her that it wasn't okay, and she had a few privileges taken away for this little pre-K girl. Now, a few days later, she was telling her grandma all about it, and she ended her story with this, oh, I need to get my act together. <laughs> Somehow, even at her young age, she knew that she needed to wise up. So what does the Apostle James have to say about getting our act together, about finding wisdom. So let us listen for the word of God as heard in James chapter 3. Today I'm reading from John Peterson's um, translation version called The Message. Beginning at verse 13. Do you want to be counted wise? To build a reputation for wisdom? Here's what you do. Live well, live wisely, Live humbly. It's the way you live, not the way you talk, that counts. Mean-spirited ambition isn't wise, isn't wisdom. Boasting that you are wise isn't wisdom. Twisting the truth to make yourself sound wise isn't wisdom. It's the furthest thing from wisdom. It's animal cunning. It's devilish conniving. Whenever you're trying to look better than others or get the better of others, things fall apart and everyone ends up at each other's throats. I think I hear a little bit of the gospel story in that statement. James goes on to say, real wisdom, God's wisdom, begins with a holy life and is characterized with getting along with others. It's gentle and reasonable, overflowing with mercy and blessings, not hot one day and cold the next, not two-faced. 
You can develop a healthy, robust community that lives right with God and enjoys its results only if you do the hard work of getting along with each other, treating each other with dignity and honor. Where do you think all these appalling wars, wars and quarrelsomeness comes from? Do you think they just happen? Think again. They come about because you want your own way and fight for it deep inside yourselves. You lust for what you don't have and are willing to kill for it. You want what isn't yours and will risk violence to get your hands on it. You wouldn't think of just asking God for it, would you? And why not? Because you know you'd be asking for what you have no right to. Your spoiled children, each wanting your own way. You're cheating on God if all you want is your own way, flirting with the world every chance you get. You end up enemies of God in God's way. And do you suppose God doesn't care? The proverb has it that he's a fiercely jealous lover. And what he gives in love is far better than anything else you'll find. It's common knowledge that God goes against the willful proud. God gives grace to the willing humble. Again, I almost hear the words of Psalm 1. And John, or excuse me, James says this finally, so let God work his will in you. Yell aloud no to the devil and watch him scamper. Say quiet yes to God and he'll be there in no time. Quit dabbling in sin. Purify your inner life. Quit playing the field. Hit bottom and cry your eyes out. The fun and games are over. Get serious, really serious. Get down on your knees before the master. It's the only way you'll get on your feet. Again, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When considering all these readings for today, especially Psalm 1 and James, it was impossible, at least it was for me anyway, to not hear the theme of wisdom loudly and boldly beckoning us to consider wisdom. So how do all of these descript descriptive words and phrases come to life for us and come to life within us? in a day-in and day-out basis? Is there a concise definition of wisdom? How can I, how can we learn to be wise? Can we acquire wisdom? If so, what are we acquiring? Psalm 1 sets the stage for all of the psalms that follow. And with a bit of speculation, maybe Psalm 1 somehow shaped the Jewish convert James and how he thought about wisdom as well. As Psalm 1 says, happy are those who delight, who value, who take pleasure in, who engage, who explore the word of the Lord, the law of the Lord. The theologian Walter Brueggemann, he calls this playful activity, and I like that image. Being unafraid to experiment, to take God's teaching, to try God's teaching on, if you will, for size. And so Brueggemann writes about becoming a Torah-shaped person who learn by doing and who regularly throw themselves into exploring life with God. As someone wrote, the more we engage, the more we are nourished and molded. Happy are those who wrestle with God and wrestle with God's teaching, and in that process are shaped into God's image. Wisdom is a very active process and an attentive process. Active in our engagement with God and attentive to life within us and to life around us as well. Now for me, this week, those ideas and thoughts really came to life in an interview I heard on the CBS morning show with David Gregory. Maybe some of you also saw that interview with him. David Gregory was the former host of the NBC Sunday morning show Meet the Press. Now, Gregory's just released a book 
and it's titled, How's Your Faith? An Unlikely Spiritual Journey. Now, the first part of that title, which was I was intrigued with, the first title part of that title, How's Your Faith, actually came from a question that President George Bush asked Gregory back in 2008. Um, President Bush had heard that Gregory was on a spiritual quest, and so he asked him, how was your faith? Because Gregory was exploring um, his journey as a Jewish man, married to a Christian woman, and raising three children in the Jewish faith. Gregory writes that he was seeking meaning and purpose in life, and he had come to conclude that the only source of where he could find meaning and purpose was in his relationship with God. Now, his journey began before his public fall from grace in July of 2014 when he was um, fired, in essence, from his position on Meet the Press. So when he lost his job, he writes this, that he sought comfort in God's presence, and he wasn't disappointed. In the interview, he, off, he also openly speaks about his own shortcomings and his failures, because that was a part of his life story as well. And he said this, if I had been a kinder man, if I had been a wiser man, maybe if I had given more, perhaps I would have gotten more. And I remember in the interview, he teared up as he talked about some of these things. It felt like the words of a chastised man, a man who was humbled, humiliated, who recognized his own part in his failures. But his story doesn't end there. His journey of faith continues, even writing that he recognizes that his experience is no different than that of many Christians. It's a journey of a lifetime in which he is changed, but still flawed. Even when I fail, he writes, God keeps calling to me to keep on, to try again, to dig deeper. Or, in the words of Brueggemann, the Christian theologian, to continue the quest to live a Torah-shaped life with God. So for us as Christians, what does this Torah-shaped experience with God look like? It seems to me that both the gospel story that we read and the writings from James point us to some possibilities. In the gospel story, rather than chiding the disciples for their misunderstanding of who Jesus was, Jesus instead offers a very tangible, touchable image. He takes a child in his arms and he tells them to welcome a child. And in welcoming that child, they are welcoming him and they are welcoming God's wisdom. They're embracing God's wisdom. They're embracing God. And that is a reversal of power as we understand it in terms of earthly power. Now, as a disciple, James must have eventually heard himself somehow even being transformed by what Jesus said. For he calls the church to embrace that upside-down nature of wisdom as well. Now, to be sure, James was writing to the church, and he was spelling out characteristic for church leaders. To be pure, to be peaceable, to be gentle, to be patient, to be merciful, to be compassionate, to be sincere, as opposed to boasting, mean-spirited, quarrelsome. As James puts it, who is wise? Look at their life. Maybe characteristics to evaluate all leaders, not just in the church. But James was speaking to the church and encouraging the church to be a place where together we can journey with God and journey with each other. A place where in our saintly days and in our sinner ways we can develop some wholeness and some integrity of faith and of life. 
a place where we can explore God's teaching with that sort of playful attitude that Brueggemann talks about. Wisdom isn't something to be possessed like knowledge or somehow arriving at some final outcome or destination. Wisdom is meant to be lived and relived. Lived and relived because we know as a human being we are both saint and sinner. We are consistently inconsistent. On one day we can sense and know God's presence intimately and then on another day we can feel that God is as far away as the distant star or as distant as the center of a very dark pit. For a time we may feel like that tree planted by the water in Psalm 1 and then times where we feel like we are in a dry and arid desert. One week, one week we may feel like we are living well, we're living wisely, we're living humbly in our dependence on God. And we're saying that quiet yes to God. And then in another week, rather than yelling a loud no to the devil, we're either dabbling in sin or we're boldly saying, hey, you know, bring it on. For me, one of the greatest things and one of the most frustrating things about the Bible is that it is not a simple how-to book. If we do A, then we will follow B, and then C, and D, and E, and so on. Now, I heard another interview this week with Pastor Nadia Bowles Weber. She's a Lutheran pastor, and she serves a church in Denver, Colorado with this name, House for All Sinners and Saints. This month, she released a new book entitled Accidental Saints, Finding God in All the Wrong People. Now, I recently started that book after I heard her being interviewed on NPR's Fresh Air with Terry Gross. And she argues and says that God doesn't love us more if we do all the right things, all the good things, all of the time. For we know that Jesus offers grace all of the time to all of us, no matter what, no matter who we are. Christianity has nothing to do with rules. It is the process of things constantly dying and then being made new. She writes, I think God is wanting to be known. And my experience, she says, of God wanting to be known is much more in the person who is annoying me at the moment rather than in the sunset. God is present in these challenging interactions. I read that and I had to say, Amen, sister. Once again, I hear Psalm 1, the good news of Mark, and the writings of James. Despite our inconsistency, God offers grace over and over and over again so that in our walk, grace and wisdom can enliven our lives, shift our perspectives, enliven our serious but playful journey to live Christ-shaped lives. But it's a process over time, one that's not done perfectly if what we are striving for is perfection. I was here um, in August. No, I guess it was two weeks ago. I was here in August. But two weeks ago, I heard Samantha Armstrong speak about her experience in the Ocean Project, I think is what it was called, the Summer Project. And she talked about being part of learning about a spiritual journey through the disciplines of prayer, meditating, reading the Bible. And she said she learned something great from the teacher of that is that you may be humming along, doing your Bible reading, doing your praying, all of those things, and then, you know, we can lose traction. But we can come back again and again. It's not failure. Sometimes we are the accidental saint looking for God. And then other times, maybe we're that wrong person in another person's life 
as Bowles Weber named it. Now for me, it was both thrilling and burdensome to reflect on these Bible passages for the past two weeks. It was thrilling to chew on the word of God, to delight in the law of the Lord. It was poignant to think about Jesus embracing that little child and calling me to welcome his wisdom just like I would welcome a little child. It was intellectually stimulating to dissect those 11 verses, because that's how many were there, 11 verses from James, and to consider those characteristic of wisdom, gentleness, reasonableness, mercy, peaceableness, consistency, and then the unwisdom, bitterness, arrogancy, selfishness. Burdensome because I know I fall short. Maybe not all of the time, but more often than I like. More often than not, more often than I want. I am like that little four-and-a-half-year-old granddaughter, shaking my head and saying, oh, i got to get my act together. i got to get my act together. But thank God, it doesn't end with me. Day in and day out, it begins again and continues with God. For God, who began a good work in me many years ago, began a good work in all of you as well, will bring it to completion, not just in us as individuals, but in us as the church. As we worship, as we sing, as we pray, as we play, as we drink coffee, as we trust, as we work, and as we live imperfectly together in the church of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen.